Welcome back to Money Discourse. Coming up today, are central bankers softening their stance? Crypto's on a comeback. Who's behind this? Massive job cuts affecting all of tech. How is ChatGPT affecting Google, Microsoft and their earnings? And of course, most anticipated for me, Tesla earnings. Take it away, Rajan. This year has started off pretty well in general on an overall basis, even though you know we're hovering around that 4,000 mark in the S&P. Um, we're definitely starting to see a lot more moderation in the central bank speak, especially at the Fed, as they're reaching towards their terminal point. And the overall consensus is there still is a little bit more to go, um, but it seems like they're gonna be doing a quarter basis point at, at the next uh, Fed meeting. And um, th they're still pushing towards a 5%, five, just over 5% terminal rate, although it's still disagreeing with what the bond market is pricing in. The Fed, like I mentioned last time, is saying, saying that they'll be looking to hold rates at this point for the whole year, pretty much. Whereas the bond market are pricing in that towards the mid to end of the year that we start um, coming back down in rates. But the US mortgage rate, the 30 year, was the lowest level since um, I would like to say like November last year or something like that. Um, so you're seeing long term rates definitely starting to fall. So these the mortgage rates are still higher, but they've come down quite a bit from the record levels that we've just seen in general. And then we have a lot of this. The Fed, they were out in force this whole week. Um, making comments and that generally dictated the way the market moved. Um, we had um, on Friday, we had the Fed, which one's it? The Fed Brainard, I believe. He's the vice deputy, um, deputy, you know, behind, um, what do you call it, uh, Powell. And he hasn't been, he hasn't spoke since, um, or he hasn't spoke, spoke since February, I mean, November last year. So they came out and he did note that inflation remains high, but these tentative signs, wage growth is moderating. Fed will stay the course. And does note that inflation has been declining in recent months and that data point to subdued growth ahead and will take time and resolve to get high inflation down to 2% target. But either way, when Brainard did speak, it did help the market a bit. We did go up a bit because we've just seen the tone, just the tone in general has changed. The hawks, still hawkish, but less hawkish than they were before, all acknowledging that we're coming nearer to that um, to that terminal level in the Fed. Uh, although the ECB were a bit more hawkish, we did see comments from the Guard this week and some of the other ones, Oli Wren, um, they all spoke still saying that inflation fight ain't over. But again, I think the markets are all taking it in that um, that the ultra aggressive hikes are now done. And now we might get a 25, you know, maybe a 50, but a 25 ma mainly. Um, and so that has helped push a lot of these growth names up, especially uh, crypto, which is obviously tied quite closely to growth in general in terms of their correlation in price movement. So we saw Bitcoin, which literally was trading in 16,000 mark last week, Trade to a high of 23,000. Ethereum went above 16,000. Uh, we've just seen some big rallies across the board in a lot of these altcoins. Uh, Solana had a big move that, that's that gone up um, to now above 25, having been below 10 bucks literally a couple of weeks ago. So that's a two and a half bagger in like two, three weeks. Um, Polygon is above a buck. Uh, Cardano is almost 40 cents. Dogecoin, is, Dogecoin almost 10 cents. So, you know, Dogecoin doing what it does and Sheepcoin and all, all of these ones. Uh, so it's all just leading to this sort of rally in Tesla as well. That's moderated trading up around the 130 mark, still way below where it was like a month ago, but well off the lows of one, 100 almost that we did get last week. So um, so you're seeing that. So in general, it's been a bit more of a, you know, we've seen volatility come down a lot too. So in general, it's been um, a much more pleasant um, time to trade with this market and you know a lot of the portfolios coming off these like, real dirt low levels. Um, I've managed to clear out a lot of my positions, which has been very helpful. So I've got a lot more dry powder than I did a couple of weeks ago, which is nice. And now I'm just really debating like, what should I do with this crypto? Because obviously I've got a little bit of um, Bitcoin still. I've got um, you know a small amount in a lot of these altcoins, but you know there is a theory that uh, Binance is behind this crypto move, and a lot of people are not sold on this move as being a genuine move and um so I, I, let me just there, there's these tweets you know and again you don't know how accurate or how much they actually mean but um this um, yeah. so this um is from one account but what he does is he's algamated all of these whale alerts which sort of brings you to the attention of big money moving between different accounts and then with this move up we've seen how 203 million BUSD was minted across Paxos Treasury when, uh, well, as Bitcoin was moving, and earlier 133 million uh, BUSD was um, minted at Paxos Treasury, and then another 200 million, another 352 million, and these are this is almost like a like a billion dollars worth of BUSD and USDC that's been um, just been added as liquidity, and it, it's. It's all, so it seems like there's a lot of big whales pushing a lot of money around, which has led to these big, big moves happening in crypto. And the, and the real question is, is Binance behind it? That's, 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 the, that's the question it goes. And according to this guy, he's saying, make no mistake, this is a Binance-related rally. 
He is totally forged by lending out BUSD for a dime to Wales, who then do the dirty work for him. This is how it works, not pumping himself, but providing cheap liquidity. And um, so it's very interesting, all these theories. And the real question is, you know, obviously, when you get moves like this, big money pushes it. How long is this going to last? And is it going to rug? And it happens a lot with these cryptos where you get the rug movement and stuff like that. So I'm actively just monitoring this to see, you know, I'm debating in my head, should I take some off? Should I take 10%, 15% off? And are we going to go back below 20,000? Or is this like a real sustained move? I mean, I mean, it's, it's interesting. But again, this has also been aided by the general move in the market where we're seeing a lot of these um, tech names and um, growth names all rallying quite strong. You know, even Michael Saylor is saying Bitcoin to the moon yesterday. So, you know, it could be a coordinated effort. People are saying like exactly what you said, Rajan, the BTC holding the line. And Twitter is probably the best place in the world to really go for real time news about all of these things. So, yeah, I'd agree. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you just have to follow the money flow. That's it. Right. I mean, you exactly. see these huge, huge money flows going through. And I'm sure Binance at the end of the day, they're the big ringleader in this whole thing as everyone else is just flopping by the wayside. So, um, you know, who really knows what's going on behind closed doors? But the main thing is Bitcoin's going up. Uh, the, 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 a lot of the junk that I'm in, like, uh, you know, my, my proper bag holders, um, they're going up. And it's just a matter of how much are they going to go up before I just go right from being down from a 90, 80% loss to a 50% loss. That, that's my criteria. If I can get to a 50% loss I'm out, uh, on a lot of these, you know, dud companies that are still not making any money and uh, hemorrhaging cash. So in terms of, in general, looking at the S&P 500, we can see that even though it looks like we've rallied a lot, the, the, the market has just been going sideways this week, but it's the Russell and uh, those type of indices with small caps, which have rallied quite a bit. So you can see we had a, a bit of a, a big down move. I think it was on Wednesday and, and on Thursday we were subdued. And on Friday we had that big rally where we rallied over 70 points. So um, in general, we're trading sideways for the S&P, but um, it's been it's been good. It's been good for all the crap that's been on the, on the floor <laughs> that mainly we've been part of, well, I've been part of. And so what are your thoughts on Buru talks about a severe recession is likely to land in a few months. How's that going to affect everyone's portfolios? The, the recession could come. We might already hit a bottom or not talking about how we're underpricing a recession and earnings are going to really suffer. And even oh. Mr. Moyur Taka is a good follow as well. If you haven't saying, you know, we're already in a recession and the markets haven't priced it in and Fed's still removing liquidity. M2 growth is negative. Yeah, only the first time in history, literally stat after stat. My, my opinion for this, right, I've seen a lot of these arguments. Again, we don't know. We don't know. But my opinion is you can't have a severe re recession with employment being the way it is, right? Unless you start getting the job cuts and uh, people getting mass laid off. But we saw the uh, initial jobless claims out of um, uh, really cool, uh, this week. It was actually below 200,000. Or was that last week? No, this week. 200,000. And, and the jobless claims are so low. They're not creeping up to 250, 300,000 where you would expect it with these so called layoffs happening everywhere. Like these, like Google, their package for those laid off are so generous. Six months, 12, like this. So, I mean, these guys will be fine. And um, although a lot of this recession requires people to be laid off, and while people still have a job, they can afford to pay off debt. And, you know, they might not spend as much. Sure, that could definitely be the way. But unless you start getting mass layoffs, I, I just don't see it. I don't but see it and so, until the, job the thing is that like, how good is that number because they just keep on revising it like who's making up these numbers and then a couple of months later oh sorry we're wrong let's just readjust those numbers and when you actually look at the jobless claims i mean say if some people have to have two jobs right and you know they lose their main one or they lose one other job like it doesn't take that into account it yeah, just i think there's a lot of part-time jobs. jobs there's definitely yeah. a lot of part-time jobs a lot of people doing side for. gigs you know all of these yeah. things nothing is taken into account right now on that and so basing the whole economy based on those job figures and this is only anecdotally but obviously seeing all of the job cuts are from big tech you look onto linkedin i'm sure you're going to see so many people that are looking for opportunities now you know a lot of people i know are posting things like you know looking for a new position i've been laid off etc cetera, etc cetera. like it, it doesn't seem like on the ground that the job market is as uh you know, you know what the weirdest thing is because normally in a type of recession is the lowest end workers are the ones that are the ones being laid off and they're the ones that are the most financially understrained and they're the ones that end up foreclosing on the mortgage and this and that but it seems right now is the more higher end worker that is losing their job. Yet the amount of positions for, um, you know, supermarket worker working at like Costco and all that, they're, they're hiring like crazy still. Um, so um, so it's, it's a different way around this recession. And it's just the people with much more high paid jobs are the ones that are getting laid off. Like there was Goldman, Goldman Sachs actually reported. And it was funny because uh, Goldman reported and their stock was down 7%. Morgan Stanley was up 7%. So it was two totally contrasting reactions. but. According to this report, that Goldman are only paying like 10 to 15% bonus rather than, uh, you know, and a lot of these. So, for example, 
these hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand bonuses are only like fifteen thousand, twenty thousand, twenty-five. They've slashed the bonuses massively. And in, and and I was hearing these comments that some of these people are now able to make their mortgage and this and that. It's because these guys that are heavily paid have bought the you know the mega fancy house, the mega fancy car, and and now this is where it seems like a lot more of the trouble it might be than on the lower end of the scale, which we're usually used to in a traditional type of recession. You know, so it's interesting the dynamic of these people. And then these guys, like when you get fired from McDonald's, you're not getting six months compensation, you're done, right? <laughs> or, you know, whereas but these I guys are all getting severance and hugely this. So right now, short term, they're, they're fine. Okay, you know? and, and yeah. your, your comments about this, right? The SPX is at 4,000, right? 18 forward PE and saying that the recession is not the implied base case yet. And if it delivers a uh, EPS, a moderate EPS of $210 and trades at 15 PE, the price target is 3150. What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think if we do get a proper recession and, and the economic numbers back it up, I mean, we, I have seen it on like some of this, uh, the New York Fed um, data, oh, the Empire Fed Manufacturing Fed. data, which was um, really low. I think it was the worst level since yeah, it was, it 2009 was, yeah, yeah. or something. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the PMI, Chicago PMI. So you're seeing a lot of those numbers starting to um, really More take hold. Months, yeah. Yeah, so you're seeing that. Um, so a lot of these PMI numbers are um, happening. But the thing is, is if inflation continues to fall because of what's happening, remember the Fed just rules the roost. So if the Fed starts, um, you know, if they start tapering off on rates, and as soon as they indicate a rate cut, the market like that, that's it. Let's get back on the side of the Fed. Market might go up. So even if there might be a recession, for sure. But if the Fed is on your side, then um, it won't be as bad as what I think. But I also think like, do the you same, think they're going to be on the this... side? Yeah, that's the thing. Are they going to well, be? It all side? depends. I think. I think now. The cost of capital the is still high. Yeah. Huh? The data, the data. No, but it's not data. Good. The data has been showing it, but they're still raising. This story keeps on changing all the time. Remember when in November, when we had the second lower number of inflation and they're like, okay, you know, the Fed's going to U10 and then they carried on and now they're going to go another 25 and then people are just, okay, it's going to go up another 25 and then another 25 and then, you know, it's going to keep on going. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. The data is showing that you you just saw the charts that were put up, ISM, PMIs, all of that stuff is coming down. And like, why do you want to overshoot it? But it's not about the data. It's about how they want to manage expectations. They don't want the market to fly up. They want the market to go up slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah. I don't think that well, uh, the market is up so much. They don't is... want that to happen. They want to keep it down. They want to keep the wealth down. They want, they want to keep... See, I think there's two, there's two thoughts of the way you approach this, right? You can always have an opinion. You can have a base case scenario. But in terms of trading it, when you see things start to really show something, then you adjust. Like it, it, the, the one thing about trading, I feel like, to be successful is that you should... You can have a view, but you have to be fluid in that view. And you can't just be hell bent on that one view. Like yeah. you're like, all right, there's going to be a recession. And then as the market keeps on going up and, but you still just go, but no, this is what's going to happen. But you have to trade what you see, not what you think. And that's always the, the best way I'd say to, um, to navigate this market. And in the way it seems right now, um, if you can clearly see the data is showing something different, you can see the Fed is changing their tune and you react to what you see. And so being fluid and not being so steadfast in their views. So although I don't think there's going to be a severe recession, sure, there might be a recession, but I don't think there's going to be a severe recession, but I'm not saying it can't happen. And if it does happen, change your view, um, adjust your portfolio, adjust the positioning, adjust the companies that are in it, um, you know, and then. But that, when, that when are be... they going to say we're in a recession? It's only after the recession is, you know. Oh, yeah, no, but that's the thing. Yeah. You don't, <laughs> you don't, they don't, they'll never say it. Like if you look at the Atlanta Fed GDP now data, mm -hmm. it starts coming, you get a raw data pretty much from, soon as it's the next quarter and there's real updates from the atlanta fed and uh, they give updates pretty much every week uh their atlanta fed gdp before the actual main gdp comes out so it's, it's continually changing so this quarter we i think we're like a 3.5 percent growth um so that's nowhere near a recession atlanta fed gdp that's what they're what that's what it's saying so you can always see these type of terms but when you start seeing these preliminary data ahead of the major data come out and it's all pointing one way then uh that's what that's a way to i mean this is the tools there are but you know no one can um like really say beforehand what's going to happen. But I mean, I guess right now with the, with the market the way it is, um, you know, everyone just gets a bit excited and, <laughs> you know, and so here we go. So um, this is the Atlanta Fed. They do their GDP now forecast. They update it every time. So on the January the 20th, which was a couple of days ago, they gave the latest estimate, which was three and a half percent, which was unchanged from their previous one. So, I mean, we've gone from below three to above four, back to below three now, mid between mid three and mid four. And then they've got all their analysis behind it and this updates every week and this is for q4 gdp so well before the gdp comes out and again it doesn't mean that is what the number is going to be but you can look at data like this that change in real time every like a few points a few times a week so i mean this q4 gdp has been tracking since october 
And you can see it's been fairly steady. And sometimes you might get um, real different declines, upward declines, downward declines. But this has been pretty fairly steady, which gives me confidence that Q4 GDP is going to be in this range between three or four, right? And so now Q4 GDP, I believe, is coming out pretty soon. It's going to now track to Q1 GDP. And then we're going to start from, you know, from the beginning and keep on tracking it for three months before that data comes out. So things like that is what can give you an idea well ahead of the actual figure, which is obviously backward looking since those three months of happening, um, what is really happening in the market. And then it gives you the commentary alongside um, that gives you the reasoning for the different um, changes in the GDP forecast by Atlanta Fed. So this this is something that can be looked into. Um, and yeah, and then I think see what it is. But I mean, right now they're forecasting three to 4% growth this quarter. So it's far from a recession, but not saying it can't happen during the end of the year. So we'll see. Um, but again, we, we're into earnings season. Um, we had all the banks, we had JP Morgan, we had um, Citigroup. Group, all of them come out this week. We had a few more um, uh, that came out. We had Netflix that had a very positive reaction. And again, the numbers weren't that great, but they had good subscriber growth. And uh, that is what pleased the market as it always is. I think that, that's the one company where the EPS yeah. and revenue is just irrelevant to yeah. the it's overall all about subscriber growth. And yeah, it, it's, it's all happening in Europe. Uh, you know, America is pretty subdued, but, but there was big um, gains in Europe. I think three and a half million subscribers added in uh, Europe. And, um, and now it's going to be interesting because I believe it's the beginning or the end of February, where they're going to implement the sharing premium. So I don't know what's going to happen with our Netflix subscription, uh, where we're always sharing it. But now it's um, it's uh, it's going to now uh, apparently they trialed it out in some Latin American countries, and that they're going to add the the surcharge for sharing the Netflix account. So how much that will have an impact in the states, uh, we'll see. Yeah. So with Netflix, it's all about subscriber growth. If you look at when there was concerns in subscriber numbers, you know we're up over a hundred percent since then, which is just phenomenal. If you bought in. Uh, June uh, lows of last year. But if you look at it compared to, say, a stock like Tesla, another high growth one, uh, it's all about margins. No, first it's about demand. And then when demand concerns are raised, then it goes to margins. And then when margin concerns are going to be addressed in this Q4 earnings, it's going to be something else. You know, like it's all always about concern. And you can understand because the bears, they're actually having an amazing time uh, right now. Well, they have had, uh, especially in the last, you know, four months or so, they've been having the time of their lives, getting their money back from the massive losses they've had in uh, uh, short and toss yeah. Bill Gates is break even. I wonder if Bill Gates is out right yeah. now. You know, to be honest, he, yeah. he, he must be really happy, but he's probably not so happy about his wife. Yeah, but to be yeah, honest, anyone, old dog he is. Yeah, just... <laughs> anyone in Netflix, you know, congratulations if you were. Uh, if you did get in in June lows, I'm sure it's going to be like this for for Tesla and a few of the other names, Amazon, Google. They're all going to bounce back, but you know, we've been seeing um, massive job cuts across all of tech. We've had Google firing twelve thousand, Microsoft firing ten thousand, and Amazon, uh, well, sorry, and Amazon firing eighteen thousand workers. So this is like exactly what the Fed wants. They want to see destruction. They want to see job losses. They want to see things go really bad, and that makes them happy. Isn't this a crazy world? You know, before if you if you just go back to 2020, 2021, any little bit of news, it'll be like, oh, someone Hertz is buying some cars off uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Lordstown or whatever it was, and then the stock will be up like 30 percent. Now it's like you know, good news is bad news and bad news is bad news. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like since the beginning of this year, you know, there's a lot more optimism in the market. So we'll see. Yeah, we I, mean, do I, think, I think we were, dirt. yeah, we, we, were, yeah. we were in peak fear um, coming into the end of last year. But I mean, these job cuts are very interesting in Google because um, we, we, first of all, these tech companies were way too fat. And we could see from Twitter earlier this year how, um, how Elon has cut a lot of the fat and is still running really fine. And then how the market forced the hand on Meta and uh, Meta went to as low as 88 bucks. Now Meta is almost 140. So that's been a great bounce if you played it then. Um, and now Google and Microsoft are doing the same. And only Apple's left. That's the only big tech company that hasn't announced any noticeable job cuts. But with Google, it's very interesting because we've seen some, um, uh, we've seen articles all along the way to see the sort of criteria in which they're laying off people. And apparently it's caused a lot of strife among a lot of the workers that work there. And, um, you know, apparently, according to these articles anyway, that the Google employees are asking the leadership several questions about the criteria for the layoffs. And apparently a lot of the some high paid people or people with promotions are some of the people that have been laid off. So the question is, are they getting rid of the massively paid workers? Because, I mean, even though it's a 5%, 6% cut among staff in terms of the actual salaries as a percentage of the overall workforce salary base, it could be like 15% or 20%. Because we all know like there's some big dinosaurs that with these very senior engineers and developers that are pulling in some serious cash. and, um, And a lot of them, don't do that much work. You know, it's always the, the, the guys at the bottom doing all the work and these guys are just chilling because they've done their work five years ago and they're just getting paid handsomely. And so now Google's starting to trim all of that fat out. And um, 
Uh, and, and the thing is that it's still a desirable place to live. So they'll have plenty of people that are willing to work there, but it's just these massively paid people with these half a million bonuses or a million plus in total are getting laid off. And so it's very interesting, the tactic that they've been using because there's been a lot of excesses at these um, at these tech companies, so much excess. And I feel like now management is definitely starting to rein in, but they're complaining. This is what the staff are saying. They made $17 billion profit in the last quarter. Why do you need to fire anyone? Like, why, why you need to do job cuts? But you know, it's all about you have to giving the Wall Street what they want. They, they, yeah. the, the, the stock went up five and a half percent on the back of these job cuts, and this is what the market wants. You know, the stock has been slowly falling, 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 trading, traded at like eighty-eight dollars a share, which was the equivalent of like sixteen hundred, seventeen hundred, almost down fifty percent from the high. And now we're back above ninety, trading towards like ninety. I don't know what it was, ninety-three, ninety-four. So this is what the market wants. And same with Amazon, went from a low of eighty-two, trading closer to a hundred. Um, this is what the market wants. Yeah, exactly. Trimming the flat giving the Fed what they want. The thing is, what, what grinds my gears, but well, obviously it's expected. Anything Elon's involved with, he will always put a negative spin on there. When yeah. Elon fired just half the staff and said, look, well, actually you can stay if you want to, or you leave if you don't want to come into the office. There was massive, massive coverage on the press painting him in such a negative light. The headlines were crazy, even though the actual content of the article sometimes were a bit more reasonable, but the headlines just made it sound like everything was going nuts. But then you remember in 2014, Microsoft let 18,000 people go after this acquisition of Nokia, right? Literally, they, they bought Nokia, just fired a whole bunch of people, and no one went crazy then. But if Elon Musk does it, everyone goes nuts. With Google, has ChatGPT got anything to do with these layoffs? It could ChatGPT or any kind of AI do some of the work of these two hundred fifty thousand dollar plus salaried guys who are, you know, like you said, potentially not doing too much uh, valuable work, adding to the top line. So, I mean, um, it's interesting because you know, search hasn't really changed for the last 15, 20 years. Like, there's more e-commerce um, out of search. There's a lot more advertisement. There's more monetization of search. But the raw search, yeah, maybe like the results part of it. But in terms, you still got a taskbar. You still just search and you just get a bunch of websites. But where ChatGPT is really giving you the answer you want and not just a link to a website that might have the answer you want. And the thing is now with Microsoft that they're, you know, they could be prime to benefit from it, considering they're a big investor in open AI and part of this and could chat GPT be integrated into Bing and how much could that shake things up? Now we've got Microsoft reporting after the close on Tuesday. So it'd be very interesting to see if there's much commentary in terms of chat GPT and Bing and whether they're going to even mention any type of potential integration or not. But do think that Google's number one product could be coming under threat from, and which happens every cycle. There's always a new entrant. You know, something just doesn't last forever. There's a disruptor. The disruptor is here. The real question is, how can it be integrated into a mainstream product like a search engine, and how could it really change the overall, um, um, you know, in terms of the overall product offering, and does it make it more desirable than just asking Google something? You know, because it'd be very interesting. Because Bing, I still I think only accounts for like you know single digits in terms of overall search volume. Google is the absolute bam off when it comes to this. So um, it'll be very interesting. Their earnings are on Tuesday. Google is next week. Yeah, so just on to your chat GPT point, super, super interesting space at the moment. Obviously, Microsoft is said to invest 10 million into OpenAI. It's interesting because OpenAI was supposed to be a non-profit organization, but you know they're spending millions of dollars a day in just running the servers to allow a chat GPT to actually run to the public. And a lot of times recently, you, know, you might have noticed if you tried to log in, it says, uh, you know, the servers are kind of overloaded at the moment, so you can't really use it because this has actually been the fastest ramp to a million users of any platform ever. I think it only took five days. And, you know, everyone who's used it is saying it's phenomenal. Even my dad is just running around saying, like, this is just a phenomenal. He could read me a book, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's phenomenal. There's all these you know, concerns going on right now about ChatGPT being used by students and how uh, New York schools have already implemented bans on their networks for it and you think how are they going to stop students from using it and and actually one of the really really interesting things uh, that just came up on my twitter feed um which i'll just share with you right now is chat gpt has passed the united states medical licensing examination right today it takes four years of med school and two plus years of clinical rotations to pass right this is just incredible and this is just running on gpt 3.5 i guess and uh, there's a lot of hype about gpt4 but sam altman the ceo of openai has been talking about uh, it and you know there's all these stats being thrown around like it's supposed to be you know 10 to 100 to a thousand times more powerful the new version that's supposed to be coming out this year but he's saying that people are begging to be disappointed and they will be if they keep on thinking that i think it's going to be more iterative progress and coming out but i mean it's already phenomenal as it is i think if it gets access to more recent facts and figures we can start solving so many problems for so many people i've already used it in coding and it's just such an amazing assistant and i'm sure you know like they said on the all in podcast if you are 
anyone who's anyone is creating some kind of UI or front end to this. And you see now um, OpenAI have actually started a subscription model to ChatGPT at $42 per month. We'll see how things progress on that front. What, I mean, what do you think about that? Pretty, the medical exam? Woo, uh, yeah, I mean, that is pretty insane. insane. Like, it just, it's crazy because, I mean, really the human is just getting more and more irrelevant as these AI technologies and everything is going to keep on coming to fruition. And um, eventually when, you know, like, like I said, coming back to Google and these high paid engineers if you can integrate like i'm pretty sure there was a talk that google have already got their own version of this and you would assume that they have got some type of competing product i cannot imagine how they wouldn't have and the thing is that if they do have something like that why do they need all of these stuff getting paid massive amounts all of this stock compensation when like just chat gpt can do so much of the legwork and if they've got their own version which i'm pretty sure that can work towards their own system why would they need it and it's all part of the part of the way where um you know, just streamline the business and get rid of this. Because at the end of the day, this is not like some frontline worker at a store. Like these software engineers are like the most highest paid people in tech. So if you can go replace these software engineers, then, um, you know, oh, can you imagine the, the the boost to your bottom line? Because that's what it all comes down to. It comes down to that bottom line, bottom dollar, and that share price. That's what they care about. So this is, what it, this is what it all is, you know? But I think definitely Google have something up their sleeve because in 2019, they were demoing the tech at their annual conference, uh, uh, having the AI call a restaurant and making a reservation for you. You compare that to now, still the Google Assistant seems quite limited. And I think maybe it's potentially a public perception problem because if Google were the first ones to come out with this AI type thing, I think it would scare a lot of people, but because OpenAI have already come out with it and now Google look like the underdog, this is just my opinion. Yeah. As the underdog, they can come out a little bit late and say, okay, no, we're trying to catch up with OpenAI and you know, try to make it so it's, it, regulators aren't gonna be on their back, right? For the massive amount of job cuts. Because this is, if you think about what it can do right now, ChatGPT, how long until it's doing our accounts for us? How long until the government can use it and say, I, Elon Musk, go through all of his bank accounts and tell me what his taxes should be, right? You know, like literally, yeah. they've got access to everyone and a, a chat GPT type model could do that uh, maybe in a year or two, maybe, or even a specialized model can do that already at the moment. So job cuts- I mean, and the future is coming. You can yeah. start seeing it. You can see, yeah, the, you can see it now. Laying right? the breadcrumbs yeah. of what, a lot of, you know, like I remember when I was saying, oh, well, in general, when people say like these frontline staff are going to all be um, replaced, a lot of these checking clerks, uh, you already see it when you go to a petrol station or gas station. Uh, a lot of the time you just go in and just put your credit card at the thing. You don't need um, an attendant or anything like that. And how, uh, a lot of these, you know, like you've got these Amazon Fresh stores that you don't, you know, they don't have cashiers. And then this is the next step. And But this is at a point where you would have thought software engineers that one of the you know, the most uh, core type of um, worker, but even they can be replaced now. Um, and it, just in general, like, you just feel like every type of job can be replaced by some kind of, um, with this type of AI. Um, this is it. So um, yeah, the future cool. starting to look like this is how you can just remain relevant uh, as as these yeah. technologies keep on coming. It's, it's going to be a tough one, you know? Yeah, if you, if you think about it, even for your particular job, if, some, if someone oh, was yeah, going to yeah. be replaceable, you know? Yeah, so. literally, as soon as these uh, AI voice models, even though they're getting so much better, at, at one point, it will just be able to analyze it and and squawk it out, I guess, my job, you know? <laughs> well, let's just see, let's just see if there's an AI yeah. chat GPT that can beat the market. Somehow yeah. it can do it. That would be I'm the sure whole thing. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure there is. is already, you know, because yeah. why would you share it? You would never share it. Yeah. Just say, even like two years ago, even a year ago right now, if someone talked about AI, you'd think, oh God, it's just a buzzword for everything. But I think chat GPT has really opened up people's minds of what the technology can do and how we will end up in interfacing with it because you know like i think uh jason calicanis was he had a beta version of it on his phone where you can literally just talk to chat gpt on your phone it's not too long until you can just speak to it and you know get it to do and organize your day it's just going to be like a game changer in terms of but just like because as soon as that's plugged into google because if you've got your calendars with google if you've got your, your emails with google you can literally just ask it to do hey you know clear up all emails from morning brew or what, whatever uh, you know just just delete all of it like just the, the productivity gains that you'll be able to make are just phenomenal and i think google have it already i'm sure they, they do must do but, like yeah, we're, we're I, a company with that much resources if they don't have something the shame on them soon they should be fired but i'm pretty sure they got uh, he's the one that needs to be fired because he's got the big he's got the big but the thing is 
Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure they got something. But again, now this is what Microsoft do. Let's just see. They've made it. They announced a deal uh, where they're going to make an investment in OpenAI, take a potentially 49% stake, $10 billion investment in total. Um, and the thing is, this is now their chance to sort of integrate integrate this into their search engine and see if they can now bring change to the traditional form of search engine. You know, where, where you can literally just get answers straight away for stuff that you're searching rather than being just referred to in uh, to certain web uh, web pages and things like that. So, I mean, it. it Let's just see how this how this year works out. But I mean, so moving on, we've got the earnings. We've got Microsoft on Tuesday. We've got Tesla on Wednesday. We've got um, IBM, Visa, a bunch of other uh, names. A lot of the Dow components all reporting this week. So um, it will really give us a good picture of where the the overall economy stands in terms of the corporate perspective from a lot of these big companies. Um, so yeah, it, it, let's just see where that takes us this week. Um, it, it, I think in general now we've rallied quite a bit. It, we're not. Uh, at this stage when, you know, oh, that wasn't that bad. Let's just rally it up. I think, you know, you're going to see a lot of two-sided action um, with some of these companies. So, um, but volatility has come down a lot for option selling. It's not great. Um, and now I'm sticking to my word from last time that like my positions are so little now. When volatility is no low, I'm not interested in really uh, selling that much premium. Um, I'm being a lot more selective with my positions. Whereas before, when we just kept on tanking and you're seeing these ivy ranks through the roof. Um, yeah, you just put, put it on. You know, uh, and that's it. I mean, if I look at my portfolio, I had to take a few losses, obviously, on Tesla, a couple of other ones. Natural gas, yeah, natural gas has been a dog. I don't actually mind natural gas being down, but it just keeps on falling every day. And uh, the question is just how, this weather. It's just, I know it's now cold in Europe, but boy, over here, just water, like relatively warm. It's just, it's just insane. So I don't know where there's going to be a support in sight from that gas. Um, but um, we're definitely at, you know, over one year lows in that gas trading, like below, almost below three bucks, almost. It's like three a week. Which is crazy considering we were over 10 well almost 10 earlier last year so um again we'll see how that works out what do you say from what you've been from your point of view your portfolio how's it going yeah it's good to see tesla come back into the 130s who thought i'd be saying that you know a month and a bit ago <laughs> <Yeah>. but <laughs> everything's yeah. relative isn't it like yeah, it is, it is relative. It in, i mean oh, i love this compared yeah to it's like 100. it's up 30 percent from the 101 you know that it was when tesla dropped their prices so we've got tesla earnings really excited for that because it's really going to add some color to a lot of the market uncertainty around tesla you know i guess there's been a narrative right now about tesla should be uh, trading at the regular auto multiple instead of 25p forward p's that it's got at the moment but the thing is that i think wall street are like anyone who has that theory just needs to understand that you know it's all about growth and you don't see mercedes you know, uh, VW Group, all of those guys having growth. They've got negative growth at the moment. And the only one really who's growing is Tesla. So, you know, what uh, the market is uh, expecting at the moment, revenues to come in around just shy of 25 billion. And this is about a 40% um, growth. Whilst the thing is that quarter three, they guided still just below 50%. So this is why we've had a massive decrease in the price as well. And I think it's just communication issues with Tesla and maybe they couldn't have forced, seen it, but they could have been better with their guidance because it's always better to under guide and over deliver than the other way around. In terms of uh, EPS, you know, they're expecting around $1.13. I'm thinking around one fifteen, one sixteen to be a bit more conservative well, on the conservative side. There's a lot of reports right now about the mega packs, hugely profitable, and they have virtually unlimited demand. And there's like a two-year backlog for that. And if the battery cells that aren't potentially going into cars, or if they've got an oversupply of them, they can go into these mega packs and sell to these utility companies. However, I'm until I actually see it in the numbers, I'm not going to place too much of a uh, emphasis on like uh, over uh, shooting earnings based on that. I think at the moment, like there's been a couple of people that have been waiting outside their Lathrop facility for mega packs and they're seeing like you know five six a day um being shipped out who knows if that's the actual order quantity at the moment the capacity is 25 a day and at a roughly 2.1 million dollar asking price per mega pack um, that can obviously add uh potentially billions to the top line but we'll see how that goes i think elon definitely has said that the mega packs will be like a uh like larger than the actual auto business and we'll see if that actually comes to fruition anyway but um, yeah, looking forward to the guidance going forward. What's Elon going to say? Um, how the pricing uh, decreases have affected demand? I mean, if they're going to add some color there, uh, what they're going to actually need to do because there's actually a lot of um, crowdsourced data from the Tesla Twitter community. You know, looking at inventory levels on these vehicles. Uh, the Model Three seems to have just kind of tapered off, uh, whilst the Model Y is selling really well. But yeah, it's, I think they might have to do another price cut on the Model Three to try to make it 
just a, a bit more price competitive, even though it's a really good value right now compared to like a BMW 3 Series or whatever like that. And I'm hoping that they announce a few, you know, maybe small interior refreshes uh, on, on the Model yeah, 3 I mean, and Model Y to try to make it a bit more. Because yeah. Yeah. you know what it is, it's like, um, look, I, I got Tesla, I'm a Tesla shareholder, I want it to do well, but the cars just look in my opinion, a bit dated now, like when I, cause you just had the same design for four years. <clears throat> and then, you know, I've been looking around for them with this job and price cut. And then I spoke to you about how, um, you know, trying to look on eBay motors, car gurus, all of these kind of, just to see if I can nab a cheap Tesla model three. And there are some good deals, but now it's getting less and less, but you look at the, from a 2018 to 2022, apart from the seal around the window, which has turned from Chrome to black uh, in, in, obviously there's loads of internal changes and um, software changes, but the overall appearance of the car just can't tell the difference between 2018 and 2022, apart from that seal around the, the seal around the window. So I think, you know, a lot of these cars, the newer ones, they might not be anywhere as good as Tesla, but they just look much more appealing. They just look so much more yeah. fresher and bolder. It's like what the Cybertruck is, what what his whole thing you were saying about the Cybertruck, because all these other pickups just look so boring. We wanted to go yeah. out there with the Cybertruck. And the thing is, that's what has captured the imagination. It's turned like Marmite. And I do definitely think with, uh, with the Model 3 and the Model Y, um, give some incentive to buy a new one than like one from 2020 that's all dropped to in the 20 grand range. But I also okay. think, forget any of that, but I think the biggest thing also people are going to be asking in this earnings is, Elon's commitment to Tesla, Tesla yeah. because if you think about half of this move, no matter what he says it is, it's a lot to do with his Twitter, how much he's just involved with Twitter and really how much is he going to keep him? What is it? How, where's his positions lie in terms of the time he's going to commit to doing um, to Tesla over his, um, you know, his act, participation yeah. in Twitter. So I think that's been quite interesting to see. Yeah. You've seen a, a lot more tweets from him about Tesla and now Tesla have been tweeting pretty much nonstop. It's, it's literally adverts on Twitter regarding the safety of their vehicles. I was really, really surprised to see something on the Tesla bot because I just thought like people have just forgotten about that, even though it's literally, and if they do manage to achieve it, it's literally the most game changing tech in the market at the moment. But um, yeah, it'll be really interesting, it, like just to hear Elon talk and be a part of Tesla again, and it hopefully give some guidance on, you know, if he's going to have a replacement CEO. I know he did the poll, it seems like forever ago now, um, yeah. asking you know whether he should step down and give, give someone else a chance. Uh, but hopefully he's found someone now. If that happens, I can see a 10% run up in the stock. He's needed back at Tesla, I think, to try to drive these programs like the bot and Cybertruck. Um, what's your take on Apple? They don't seem to have suffered as badly as some of the other... Think about uh, Apple, this, yeah. this is... Uh, They've been very quiet, you know, there, there's been so much talks and, um, you know, you always get before an Apple earnings, these talks from time in China, like uh, uh, slow down in shipments of Macs, uh, sh shipments of iPhones, shipments of this, shipments of that. And, and but the thing is, they've been very quiet. They haven't um, pre-guided. They haven't said any of this, which sort of suggests to me that it's not actually going to be like, I think it's going to probably be in line or something going to be a bit because I reckon Apple, they're pretty, they've got good management and um, they do pre-warned the market they did last time and when there was an issue they came out ahead of um ahead of it so it doesn't seem like it's going to be too bad and the thing is that when you just look at generally these phone companies that they're, they're giving everyone's getting the, the biggest thing is that the deals to get these iphones are literally just giving away for free like so a lot of people who want an iphone they don't have to really pay much for it even though it's expensive it, it, all these plans are just giving it away for free just going you know get this magenta max or get this plan you get a free iphone uh trade in any phone get a new iphone for free all the deals are on iphone so the thing is that anyone that wants an iphone they're not really being financially constrained to get it if they've got one of the major um carriers yeah. so you know, I, I, I do think, this. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of tweets I've seen recently about saying Apple's a bit. More, it's still overvalued where it is at. Saying that Apple is worth more than all these companies combined. You know, like when you compare it to something like Tesla. You know, it's like, uh, I guess you know. The you know, thing is that people draw comparisons about like you know, like Tesla's worth this much on on them. Like, there's a real question you have to ask. I, have, yeah. I haven't done it, but. Yeah look at Apple's profit per quarter. And is it more than all of those companies combined? I, I, I don't even know if it is or not, but like they, they, their margins are like 37% and they do about 80, 90 billion in revenue. So their profit every quarter is about 30 odd billion, right? 35 billion is 35 billion more than all those companies combined. And if they are, then it's, then it's probably worth it that much. Like if you just want to take it to the most grassroots level, mm -hmm. right? But I, I don't know, but I, I can't imagine because think... Exxon alone yeah. is making 20 billion profit or yeah. something like yeah. that exactly. in the last quarter. So. Yeah, and it, but if you look at just the footprint, how many customers' lives do all of these brands, you know, like Coca-Cola, Nike, Walmart, you know, at and Visa, like Visa, you know, just if you think about all of these companies and then you think about the company that sells these phones and, and Macs uh, that have such an amazing, like just Steve. I wonder what it would be like if Steve was still alive. But yeah, anyway, I digress. Uh, we've, we've been uh, going on for quite a bit. Uh, anything else to add, Raj? 
No, it'll just be interesting. Hopefully, we get some more opportunities. Um, I'm a bit starved of positions to be put on, so I'm just looking for some. Um, just hopefully, I can just. That one, I'm just looking for some opportunity. You know, although the market going up is nice for the underlying portfolio, but for a trader, it's now getting a bit more boring. Whereas last year was actually great for the trading point of view, but not good for the overall portfolio in general. So, um, so I'm hoping to see some, you know, good movement and give some opportunities to put on some positions. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it is. Earnings will always be a time where we'll get these big moves. And um, the last quarter, we really did get some huge moves with Meta going down below, what, you know, moving 30 odd percent. Um, that was gigantic. We, we got a lot of companies that moved massive. So I, I'm intrigued to see whether that same level of movement is going to happen. But in general, volatility is much less. You can see it. So the market isn't pricing in as big a moves as we did see last year and last quarter. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, um, you know, so if Facebook your... dropped 30 percent again, yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah. It's just, it's... So what's your overall trade? I mean, you know, Jamath said it in 2021, like kind of, what was he, short Google, long Microsoft or something like that, you know, in terms of the spread trade. Yeah. I've seen uh, a few guys talking about like long Tesla, short the S&P, you know, type trades. And um, it's just looking at pure median, yeah. like, you know, it would Tesla forget any fundamentals, just looking yeah. at a pure technical level and the amount it's dropped. And then when you look at a lot of these other companies that have dropped a similar amount and you look at the S&P in general, in terms of a value trade, s p versus tesla yeah that makes sense because i mean what's what's the median like what's the 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 mean value right now where's the 200 moving day average i have to look at it all on the chart but you would expect some sort of gravitation towards that level and that and whereas the s p seems to have found a range right now just hugging around four thousand. so the s p is very stable right now whereas i think tesla definitely as long as this earnings reporting a disaster can definitely push back towards the 150 160 but whether it's going to go to 200 i, I don't know about that but i think 130 something special is, yeah i i think you know 130 to 150 to 160 again which will be around 450 to 500 p split yeah that could that, that could work and um so uh yeah I, I think that's a pretty good trade um in general i'm looking at some of these other ones like um I, blackstone you know they're generally a bear moth and they've got huge assets under management and they've had pretty big decline from the highs so I actually um sold a little bit of premium in blackrock and i think um, that could be a good trade i also think that some of these crypto names have rallied so big like coinbase i spoke to it last time i put a bullish bias trade but then that sort of moved up way quicker than i thought so it went from almost 30 bucks to 55 it's almost double coinbase mara uh, um michael saylor's company microstrategy all of those have gone up so much and i actually think starting to get slightly bearish some of these crypto names that is like if I see Coinbase push towards 60, 60 something, yeah, I'm definitely doing a bearish trade on that. I mean, that's a hundred percent gain in literally a couple of weeks. And I think um uh, I'll definitely considering the amount of hemorrhaging, the the massive decline in crypto volumes in general, um, I, I that, that that's what I'm looking more at, just fading some of these crypto stocks that were massively oversold, but now I think short term are a bit overbought. So um th that's it. But in general, yeah, sure. Uh, the market, I, I think uh, the trade is probably long treasuries, short, short, I mean long the market. I think I think the Fed. Although the market's already pricing that in, but I, I've already said that I think inflation is coming down much faster than the Fed thinks it is, and they say it is. So um, we'll see. But that's yeah. that's what I'll be leaning towards if I had to do something like that. But I ain't got some massive money yet. So, <laughs> so like, those long term strategic, I'm always short term, you know, strategic. Yeah. I'm just looking for volatility and I'm in and out. So I don't really have a long term bias in terms of spread trade. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what I would do if I was looking. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. Oh well, it's been a it's been a long long one. Yeah, been a long one to talk about. Had, I've had some lighting issues, so that's why it's been a bit weird. Um, <laughs> my face, so please forgive that. But um, yeah, if you liked um, what you heard, please subscribe and uh, like like the, uh, the video, and definitely we'll catch you on the next one. Lots to discuss next week. It'll be a lot yeah, of definitely. good earnings. We'll start to see a better clearer um, picture where we are from all of these corporate earnings. So it'll be yeah. good. And if, if you want any analysis on any of your favorite stocks or anything that you're looking into, please comment below. Okay, so we'll see you guys yeah. in the next one.